sex does not stop in humanitarian emergencies. In fact, it might be when people have lost everything, their security, their homes, their lives, that they turn to one another for consolation and support, and sex does happen. But very often, women and girls do not want to be pregnant in circumstances like the humanitarian emergencies they face. They want to delay that, and very often they don't have access to contraception, and particularly long-acting methods of family planning to prevent pregnancies at that time. Um, I think I learned a lot of new things because we are mainly working on development, so now here we get like, uh, you know, baited into what is the humanitarian sector and what are the challenges in advancing gender and in particular as RHR. The difficulty for me is that the timelines are very different. In development cooperation we really talk about sustainability, especially now with the new Agenda 2030 and how things work in the long term, we push donors to invest um, yeah, in this long term, not do like one or two years project and so on. And then suddenly in humanitarian, it has to be in the six months, one year period. So you have to use the same uh, needs, but the narrative around it is totally different. And also the actions that you do is, is different. So in humanitarian sector, we work uh, with all these different clusters. And there is one on health and one on protection and sexual and reproductive health rights falls a little bit between, so it's not well recognized so far. It's a bit of work to do that, to, to get it on the spotlight. We know development organizations have the strongest relationships with governments already, with civil society and with local organizations to build their capacity to mitigate the impacts of sexual and reproductive health risk in humanitarian emergencies. Apparently it's quite clear is that within the humanitarian sector um, there is a really a lack of understanding of the importance of working on gender and, and so there's a lack of gender sensitivity and so also lack of sensitivity for sexual reproductive health. So I think that will be one of the main challenges for us to overcome. So whereas you would think it's about, um, you know, trying to convince the donor community, it's also about convincing your peers, you know, other NGOs, uh, maybe UN agency people. Gender is still not being taken seriously, even after decades of advocacy. Our speakers were very honest and said that still, you know, people aren't really implementing gender sensitive programming. So yeah, that's a key issue and it's something that we really need to, really need to push on, I think. We need more actors on the ground and more actors who is lobbying the other actors within the system because now we only have a few specialised agencies. There are a lot of organisations working at EU level on SRHR but there are not many in the humanitarian fields. So I was really happy to get this invitation to speak here because we really need more organizations that can uh, also do advocacy towards European Commission, European Parliament and member states on gender and emergencies more widely and SRHR uh, specifically. But in advocacy, you really need to form alliances. You really need a lot of organizations on board. So I'm really hoping uh, that now number of organizations present here today will also start getting more active in that field rather than only in the development cooperation field. For these people who will be lobbying the European Commission and also humanitarian actors that the knowledge on the ground is very very low and it needs to be very very practical and very pragmatic to explain what they want to achieve and how especially sexual, sexual and reproductive health interventions can be life-saving in humanitarian crisis. People need to get acquainted and get to know what the MISP is, which is a minimum initial service package. You can call it MISP or SRH in emergency, as, as best fits you. But once you know what kind of uh, response you have to give in SRH in an emergency, it's easier to get more involved in it and also to shape your messages around it. So then you can decide if you want to be more active in terms of advocacy to have the MISP implemented in emergency but also if you want to work around the MISP you need a lot of capacity building, you need technical assistance, you need funding. So and as the MISP is an international standard that has been recognized it gives you already a basis around which you can work and which is quite accessible and very well documented right now. 
there are a lot of tools already available that uh, we can start working with as advocates. Um, and I also think that uh, there's also a lot of, um, of coordination and cooperation amongst uh, development and, and European actors uh, possible. What is essential is better coordination uh, among us to make sure that we uh, share our experiences, that we uh, share uh, the ongoing projects and the ongoing discussions. Uh, so that's to make sure that at least on the advocacy side we have a stronger uh, voice and coordinated voice uh, on these issues. The coordination is important and also the feeling of not to be alone in this world of fighting for the same for the same aim one of the common challenges that has come across is sort of how do you do how do you get your message across in an already busy environment or a, a sort of well populated environment where there's competing interests and how do you ensure that that doesn't detract from the overall quality of humanitarian response it's uh, difficult to reorientate your messages. It's similar but not the same and that's the difficulty. We've only just started to explore the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've, we've equipped people with basic knowledge about humanitarian work, but now the challenge is how do we move that forward? How do we move into the field? What, what do we want to say? Who do we want to engage with? I shared uh, some examples of good practices and especially of our country team in Macedonia because Macedonia has been working since 2012, so before the refugee crisis started in their country. And actually they have a quite well set up SRH working group which works very well with, the minist with different ministries and disaster risk management that is part of it. And thanks to this work actually they have been able to develop an SRH chapter that has been integrated into the National Emergency Health Plan which is quite a big achievement and it shows actually that if you work in a coordinated and multi-sectorial way you manage to achieve some achievements and thanks to that they have been able to respond uh, to, the, uh, to the refugee crisis in a more coordinated and more efficient way. We hear so much statistics and um, so many different examples, but at the workshop yesterday, talking to a colleague, um, she was telling me about the situation in Syria and how in Syria women um, who are giving birth, the number of caesarean sections have increased by 50% and these women only spend maximum of four hours in the hospital with no um, post post birth care which you can imagine is, is very very dangerous but this is the situation in Syria where people just just want to get out of these hospitals and they want to get on the road as soon as possible with their children so for me that really struck me as it's really important for us as SRHR advocates to really advocate for these women and these their rights I'm very excited to work with our members and, and putting some of the commitments into, into action and really advocating for, um, for better conditions for, for SRHR of women, girls and boys in these awful crises and situations.